Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining this bright blue fringe event, uh, which is entitled Human Rights on the Battlefield. Is Warfare Hindered by Lawfare? And I suppose the context of this is the um, Overseas Operations Bill, uh, which is currently making its way through Parliament. Government uh, has uh, brought the bill forward to stop vexatious claims, but critics uh, believe uh, that it gives it could give a green light to war crimes. So we've got a great panel today to discuss um, to discuss this issue and the overseas operations bill. Um, for those of you who don't know Bright Blue, we are an independent think tank for liberal conservatism, uh, and we're having a major relaunch this autumn. So watch out for that. Uh, but we broadly focus domestic, social, economic, environmental. Um, policy and education policy as well. And we've in fact done quite a lot of work around the importance of human rights uh, and how we tackle discrimination from a centre-right perspective. And you can see some of our reports on our website. Um, you may also, if you go to our website, see uh, a recent uh, magazine that we've just published for this conference, which looks at the impact of COVID uh, on our lives and our society. And we have an interview with Jesse Norman, uh, the Treasury Minister, in that magazine. So please go to our website to look for that. For those of you using Twitter, please um, use the hashtags bright blue and CPC20 um, to kind of amplify some of the uh, comments uh, and analysis coming from this event. Uh, and the Twitter handles that you might use as well are at wearebrightblue and at freedom from torture. So we'll be asking uh, each of the panelists here today to give five minutes and then we'll go to a Q&A. If you're watching, you can ask questions through the Q&A box on the right of your screen and then I'll be able to um, ask those um, to the panelists. So in terms of uh, panelists today, we have Bob Stewart MP, who is the uh, uh, M a member of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee uh, and M MP for Beckenham. Uh, I have also Dominic Grieve QC, who's the former Attorney General for England uh, and former Member of Parliament for Beaconsfield. Uh, Robert Gallimore, who is, a, is currently a teacher, but also a former British Army officer who served 17 years in the Welsh Guards with four tours of Afghanistan. We also have Nadine Tanasi, who was appointed by the government recently as a survivor champion for uh, the Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict Initiative. Uh, and she's also an advocate of Survivors Speak Out. So we're very um, grateful for her to joining us uh, today. Steve Crawshaw, who is the Policy and Advocacy Director for Freedom from Torture, uh, is also uh, one of the speakers. Uh, and he's previously worked for Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and was a journalist at The Independent as well. So perhaps if I could start with Bob. I believe human rights must be respected as far as possible on the battlefield and lawfare should guide warfare. My position comes from I was an army officer for 28 years and I served seven tours in Northern Ireland. And I also work for the United Nations and alongside the International Committee of the Red Cross in Bosnia. Now the army puts huge emphasis on pre-tour training in the laws of armed conflict. In Northern Ireland, we spent a heck of a lot of time understanding what we call the yellow card and the, the rules of how you take prisoners and what how you deal with them. We exercised, you know, it, we practiced with, you know, for real, for real, insofar as it was on exercise, we took prisoners and we learned how to deal with them and how to talk to them, etc. Now the bedrock for the British Army are fundamentally the, the, is fundamentally the Geneva Conventions 1949 which put out on the 12th of August 1949. Now if you actually look at this document which is quite long and detailed 
but in very simple language. It, it, it is un unlike most of the stuff I have to read in Parliament here. It's very clear and simple and well written. It covers all sorts of things like, you know, how you deal with you know, prisoners, how you deal with hospitals, how you actually look after civilians and families and how you protect prisoners. Um, it is extremely detailed and, as I've said, quite clear. And it's something that in the army we spend a lot of time making sure that everyone, right down to uh, the uh, most low-ranking soldier, understands. It's very difficult for soldiers, let's be honest. If you're in a conflict like Afghanistan or Iraq or any major war, in one minute you're trying to kill someone who's your enemy. The next minute, when you captured them, you have a responsibility for looking after them in all senses, just as much as you look after your own people, and particularly if they're wounded. And their priority in the, the wound list comes because of the severity of their wounds, not because of whether they were enemy or not. So that responsibility is sometimes very difficult for soldiers. Now, Article 32 of the Geneva Convention specifically says and clearly states that torture is not in any way acceptable. It's quite clear. And that's what I've always thought. I've used the Geneva Conventions. I've said in the field, I, particularly in Bosnia, I remember saying, you know, this is in the Geneva Conventions. This is where I get my authority from. I'll finish by talking very briefly about the Overseas Operations Bill. Yeah, you're right. It's to stop these so-called vexatious claims. And there were a heck of a lot of them that came out of Iraq and Afghanistan, a heck of a lot of them. And it put soldiers through hell often. It's not perfect. It's by no means perfect. But be quite clear that if someone has committed a war crime, regardless of this bill, regardless of this bill, that actually, and there's a, there is actually a case to be answered. In that case, they will be, they would and should be brought to trial. I'll stop there. Thank you, Bob, for that. Um, I'm going to move now on to Dominic. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to, to join this interesting and important discussion this afternoon. Can I just preface my remark with a couple of, of thoughts? There's this suggestion that there's some great lawyer-soldier split on this issue. And I simply make the point, I mean, apart from that, I've only served very briefly in the Territorial Army. I wouldn't, wouldn't put a, a great marker on that. But I have a son who's currently a junior infantry officer serving in Kabul. So uh, I, I have, it is very much in my interest, personal and family, that people should not be the subject of malicious allegations. And it is quite clear that in the Iraq context, something which we've seen happen in other contexts, actually domestically with the sex allegations against leading public figures, when you get a feeding frenzy of that sort, you go off the rails and you also encourage people to bring bogus claims. And the activities of Lee Day were, uh, in my view, scandalous uh, in, in the way that they pursued civil claims on behalf of clients arising from Iraq. It's not to say that in Iraq there were not breaches of the Geneva Convention. Baha Musa was killed by British soldiers. There's absolutely no doubt about that at all. But it's what happens when something gets spun out into a much wider suggestion of misconduct, when in fact the evidence, as it's now emerged, is simply not there. So I'm conscious of that. But we also need a reality check. There seems to be this view that particularly human rights law is in some way a major inhibition on carrying out military operations. And I simply disagree with that. The Geneva Convention is undoubtedly very important, but if you actually look at the Geneva Convention and compare it to the European Convention on Human Rights, there's only one area in which the convention is significantly different about what you can or can't do on the battlefield. Both prohibit torture, I'll come back to that in a moment, both prohibit beating up prisoners 
or for that matter, shooting them or killing them after you've um, taken them prisoner. The one area where a split developed was over the question about whether you could detain. It was a problem we had in Afghanistan because we didn't want to add it with our attorney general because we didn't want to hand over uh, uh, prisoners to the Afghan government. But actually, we were concerned about the violate, particular violations of their human rights. But actually, that has been on the current evidence of the litigation that has taken place. The Sardar Mohammed case suggests that, in fact, this problem is probably resolved. Not to say that the European Convention on Human Rights is an ideal vehicle for dealing with the battlefield, but my feeling is that actually it cannot be said to interfere with uh, battlefield roles for the armed forces. The only other exception is that clearly, what are your remedies if you are going to make an allegation that you have been ill-treated or that there has been a violation of human rights or the norms of the Geneva Convention? Either there is a domestic remedy for this, or it is likely to end up in the International Criminal Court if the UK doesn't deal with it. And that is a point that we have to keep in mind. And that brings me to the Overseas Operations Bill. I'm sorry to have to say it, but the Overseas Operations Bill is a really bad piece of legislation. It may be well-intentioned, but it does all the wrong things. Firstly, it either means something or it is a piece of cosmetic window dressing designed, if I may say so, to mislead people as to what is likely to happen. Bob said if there really are breaches of human rights, there will still be prosecutions. Well, in that case, that's no change from where we are at present. So why are we bringing in this measure? The presumption that after five years, you're never going to prosecute somebody uh, for an overseas operation offence, unless it's a sex offence, which in itself is quite an extraordinary exclusion. And I think reflects the UK's embarrassment because we've been the leading country in preventing sex offences in the context of armed conflict. But leaving that aside, if there is a presumption, it is going to make it harder to prosecute. Of course, that presumption is likely to be challenged, leading to judicial review proceedings. The Attorney General's involvement, nothing wrong in that if you want it, but it's got to be, all, got to be exercised in a wholly non-political manner. It's open to judicial review as well. I cannot see why this measure is going to offer. It's either intended to ensure that soldiers or armed forces personnel are not prosecuted, or it's actually intended to make no difference, in which case it shouldn't be there. And it introduces a two-tier system of justice where some people, for example, a foreign soldier fighting on the battlefield who we might wish to prosecute doesn't enjoy this protection, but our own armed forces personnel do. And I think one has to consider whether that is in fact right. Secondly, there's a civil litigation aspect to this too, which is also, in my view, quite wrong. It says that after six years, you can't bring a claim at all. Who's going to be the main beneficiary of that? Is it going to be armed forces personnel or is it going to be the UK government? It's actually going to be the UK government. But of course, some of those claims could potentially be claimed by UK armed forces personnel themselves. If the government really wants to go down that road, it would be much better to introduce crown immunity and bring it back than to create a two tier system for civil litigation, where again, you have the unfairness that people who are not UK armed forces personnel or the UK state don't enjoy the six year absolute time bar. Whereas at the moment, you can go to court and try and get it lifted if it's a deserving case and there is a justifiable reason for doing it. So I'm sorry, I have to say that I think the Overseas Operations Bill is a huge mistake and it's going to do, it's already doing the United Kingdom, serious reputational damage. And as we've been a leading light of trying to improve standards on the battlefield and the way people behave in these very difficult circumstances, it just adds to this catalogue that the UK doesn't seem to care anymore for trying to raise international standards. And as I say, the risk is that ultimately, as we are still signatories to the International Criminal Court, we may end up there. The reason we set up IHAT was in order to make sure that the ICC didn't get involved. I'm sorry it took so long, and I'm sorry that in fact it was necessary at all, because as I say, some of the background to this is, is very unsatisfactory. But this, I'm afraid, is not the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. We'll move now to Rob for your thoughts.
take myself off mute. Thanks, Ryan. Um, thanks very much. There was always a danger in speaking after Dominic Grieve because I usually find myself in almost complete agreement with most of his public utterances, and uh, I am again mainly here. So he's stolen most of my thunder, but I'll carry on anyway um, as I have prepared something. Um, I, I was going to sort of look at the second and third questions um, that, that were posed, which was look at the role uh, of the law on the battlefield and the balance between preventing war crimes and the pursuit of these vexatious claims. Um, the Overseas Operation Bill, at least, appears to me, a layman, to seem to imply that there sort of can be conflict or incompatibility between, on the one hand, adhering to the law, and on the other, the prosecution of successful military operations. Uh, and the government seems to believe it needs to resolve this thorny issue. Uh, and in resolving it, uh, it appears to me that it is setting itself firmly on the side of the put-upon soldier. Uh, and I, you know, again, sort of just reiterating uh, Dominic's points, I think it's a really dangerous way to look at these issues. Um, not least because I find sort of martial lionization in government a little unappealing. But as someone who previously operated very much on the prosecuting military operations side of the house, I, I used to really like the law. Um, when men sadly and tragically died under my command, the law retrospectively justified our actions uh, and ensued there was no whiff of neg negligence. Now that, and these coroners inquests, they may sound like sort of health and safety gone mad, but actually they're wonderfully salving if, if they don't actually bring the loss back. Um, in other instances, when my Afghan soldiers and I were accused of executing surrendered Taliban uh, fighters um, after our little scraps, falsely, uh, I hasten to add, um, the law came in and investigated and absolutely cleared us. Um, and even in really, really testing circumstances, when I was tempted perhaps to take immoral actions so as to take my men to a place of greater safety, um, the law put me back on the right path. I, I like the law. Um, the law and military operations should work hand in hand. Uh, I think particularly as we move to killing in a more remote manner. And I think it's really dangerous to sort of set the two up against each other or even shield them from one, one another, therefore ushering each into a silo where unlawful actions and indeed vexatious claims are more likely to occur. Um, I'm just unaware of soldiers calling for less legal counselling, clambering to be above the law or demanding that they can torture, but, but perhaps I'm moving in the wrong or indeed right circles. Um, in saying that, I'm not uh, you know, denying the sort of utter shambles that seem to surround the whole Iraq fiasco uh, and the procedures and processes for investigation probably need to be re-scrubbed. Um, so as such sort of you know, seemingly incompetent handling of so many vexatious claims c can never happen again. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't consider claims against our armed forces and operations. I just think they should be handled differently, perhaps not involve people like Mr. Shiner, because I think if you dress like a shark and talk like a shark, you probably are a shark. Um, and what I feel about this operations, uh, overseas operations bill, it just feels that this legislation might be a bit far reaching in attempting to rectify, rectify all that. Um, and the baby may leave with the bathwater. Um, I think any law that increases the risk of the guilty being absolved, absolved rather, diminishes the sort of moral authority of, of the magnificent majority, which I put 99.9% .9 of British armed forces in. Um, the, the last point I sort of wanted to address was, was this issue of torture and how the legislation might or will affect Britain's standing as an opponent of torture. Um, in short, the exemption must be removed from the bill um, if we're to have any credibility whatsoever on torture. Um, torture can't never be excused. Uh, uh, the bill sort of attempts, you know, as Dominic said, that the bill motivation may be, may, may be good. It attempts to protect errors made in the heat of battle, but, but torture does not happen in the heat of battle. It happens when people um, you know, can hear the gunfire, but they certainly can't smell the cordite. Um, it, it is a premeditated crime and deserves no protection whatsoever. Um, secondly, it's counterproductive. Um, as to be a torturing force or even to be perceived as a torturing force is a clarion call for insurgent recruiting uh, and, again, uh, undermines our own moral authority. Um, also, considering looking after our own people, we should never allow torture. Um, it's quite interesting when Mattis stood up against Trump when um, the Americans tried to you know, dance around the, le the legals with this. Um, Mattis's strongest point in opposing that is what it does to the torturer. Now, I know that seems you know, slightly almost facetious when you consider what torture can do to the victim.
um, but um, you know, it, it, it destroys the mind of those people who do it. Um, and I think just all the all the talk of uh, why we should justify it, we, we must stop justifying it with these sort of reducto ad absurdum um, sort of hypotheticals where you know, we bring up sort of Jack Bauer and 24 scenarios. Those things don't happen. Those circumstances don't happen. So we don't need to justify it on that. And just to finish on a slightly lighter note, it also, it, it doesn't work. Um, I remember when we were getting mortared, we were getting stonked in Alamara uh, in Iraq, and we used to rather tragically sort of dash out and try and find where they were firing the mortars from. And we got the um, we got the right house, but the, the chap had left, and we got the grandfather, and we, we took him in, and we certainly didn't torture him, but he was offered a Cornish pasty and some boots, and the Cornish pasty and the boots were good enough for him to give up his grandson, who was indeed the mortarer. So you get a lot further with pasties than you do torture. Anyway, that's my bit. <laughs> okay, very, very good. Um, I mean, one thing I am interested in, and I perhaps I will come back to both Rob and Dominic on this after the other speakers, is if we do accept the case that there have been vexatious claims and it is a real problem. If not the Overseas Operations Bill, what else can be put in place to try and stop those vexations? I'm interested in that. Um, but before we before we come to that, let's move to uh, Nadine, who is a survivor of torture. So I, I'm, you know, I think we're very lucky to hear uh, her perspective. So over to you, Nadine. I just want to say how grateful I am to be asked to be part of this important discussion, and. Um, I'm here to, to represent the voices of survivors. And I just want to say it's really an honor to be asked to speak. And what we always ask in our network is to survive to be bring and invited to important discussions in the things that affect us. So what I really want to say is I was very honored when I pointed alongside my colleague Kobasia Ausu as the UK first survivor champion by Lord Tarek last year. And for a long time uh, during our advocacy with the Survival Speak Up Network, we campaign for survivors empowerment, survival voices to be heard in important decision-making process. Survival in our network often say, let nothing about us be without us. And I believe that with the Preventing Sexual Violence Initiative, this government has done just that. The government showed its willingness in listening to survival voices and taking into account their approach and most importantly, demonstrated that survivor could also be part and bring solutions in the matter that affects us. I'm very grateful for the UK leadership shown in this important issue, not only by having survival, but also inviting other country to be part of this initiative. I think I'm having a problem with my laptop. Sorry, just excuse me for a moment. And I also welcome the fact that rape and sexual violence are excluded from the proposed legislation. Sexual violence should not happen to anybody. There is so much stigma and blame that is attached to this crime. And quite often, seeking justice seems like an inachievable tool. Perpetrators are often very powerful and untouchable. And seeking the road to justice is perceived as calling upon trouble for the survivor. However, I'm worried that this proposed legislation is undermining the impact on torture on survivors and what it really does to human being. Survivors of torture very often require time to heal, to rehabilitate, and five years is not enough time to recover and let her know, gather the strength. Sorry. I mean, my computer is playing up. I'm really sorry. Bring it down, please. And what I'm saying is that 
the proposed legislation will be sending the message to survivors saying, sorry, you came too late. When we know it will be hard of our survival control to begin any proceeding on time. The UK plays a very important role in finding solutions and way to seek justice and hence sexual violence for survivors. This legislation will undermine the UK reputation that I think is worth preserving. This legislation will also undermine the effort and discredit this country. The UK, I know, stands for values and rights that often get protection to people who came to seek asylum because of torture. And torture is wrong. It's a wrong act that no human should go through. And to think that a perpetrator can go, can get away with such acts by relying on the law would be a wrong use of the law, I think. And I really want to emphasize on that. And we know, and many survivors feel that justice can take time to arrive. But survivors of torture need to know that justice works and need to believe that it can be given when a person is ready to pursue it. I just want to say that I believe in this country because it offered me protection when I needed it. And part of the work we do in speaking against torture is to speak so that perpetrator would know that survivors are not always silenced. And we believe that the role of justice is also to deter others from committing the same crime. I just want to say that we must stop and think the kind of message that this proposed legislation will be sending. It might be sending the message saying that justice is best served by certain people or certain people are more deserving to be protected. And I want to say that justice is best served when it prevents an act from happening rather than occurring. When the harm is already caused, the justice in the first place has already arrived too late because what we want to do is people, the perpetrator, to not even commit the crime in the first place. And I can see that this proposed legislation for more survival, there is no difference between sexual violence and torture, that both leave the person with visible and invisible scars. Torture is one of the infringement of human rights. We know that and I've heard the right honorable man Dominic uh, saying that it was the wrong law, and at least for somebody from a legal background to actually say that. Torture is a wrong act, and nobody deserves to be tortured for whatsoever reason. And the UK is already setting an example in defending such right. But if the legislation goes ahead, I'm worried that the UK will be seen to be defending the perpetrators rather than speaking for survivors. And really, what I would like to finish by saying is that by saving good justice for survival is the one that is centered. I want to say again, good justice must be survival centered and putting a time limitation will only help encouraging and advocating for circumstantial justice that would protect the perpetrator. And if I may allow myself to leave ourselves with a question, my question would be, when we put a limitation in this proposed legislation, who are we protecting? And I thank you. I apologize for the little issue I have with my computer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nadine. Uh, and yes, we will come to your question on who the, um, the bill is really protecting. Um, and no doubt panelists will have different views on that. So um, let's let's end now in terms of speeches with Steve. Thank you very much, and, and thanks for organising this um, event. Um, I have what is always the case for a last speaker, both the challenge, the privilege, because so many of the key points have have just been made and have been um, heard, and that's really important. And the challenge, of course, is exactly the same. So what I would like to do is to pick up on just some of the key things that we've heard before we go into the discussion. This is an incredibly important moment for this bill. The Veterans Minister, um, who has been at the heart of the thinking on this bill, will be uh, speaking to the Committee on Human Rights uh, this later this afternoon. Tomorrow it begins uh, its journey through the, um, through the committee stage. And these are very, very important themes, as I think all of us um, agree. Bob Stewart talked quite rightly about the 
incredibly central role that both the Geneva Conventions play in international humanitarian law, in other words, the laws of war, the absolute global ban on torture. And he rightly says that the UK has played an important role in this. The UK, in fact, since Magna Carta, has played an important role in saying, actually, this is wrong, this cannot happen. And it's the framework that is so um, important of what's stealing. He also talked about the fact of um, the pressures that people are put under if, uh, if an investigation drags out and drags out and drags out. And Dominic referred to this also. If that happens, clearly that's a problem, but that's a process problem. It's not a reason to change the law and to make it easier to commit some of the gravest war crimes. And I think we must be in absolutely no doubt this bill does make it easier. Um, make it harder to prosecute the hardest crimes. So the word exceptional is used in the bill. This, after five years, which, as Nadine and others have said, is really just a, a blink of an eye in many senses. After five years only, it would only be in, quote, exceptional circumstances that prosecution goes ahead. And we can see what kind of signal that sends um, if, if that continues. The training, which Bob Stewart rightly refers to, absolutely right, it's really good training that is there and that's actually got better over the years it now builds in the accountability themes all of that but as one expert on these themes wrote um recently um that actually that very good training comes in significant or would come in very significant tension with this bill if it's allowed to go ahead so it's no point saying well it would still be possible in some limited circumstances to go ahead with prosecution the fact is that both for torture and other grave war crimes the is it would not happen. And I, I loved Nadine's framing a moment ago of, of how justice also casts forward in a sense. It is, of course, about accountability, but actually that very sense of seeing justice being done, that is something which makes it less likely those crimes will be committed in future. And the opposite also applies, that where there is no justice, then it becomes easier to do that in future. Um, Dominic Grieve talked about it being a, perhaps a well-intentioned bill, but really bad because it misleads people. I couldn't agree more on that. I think that's what we need to look at. It's not where the problems over here, it's what will this bill actually do if it happens? And I firmly believe there is nobody, not just listening in and being part of this panel and, 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 and listening in or watching it, but also across the country, there can be no one who actually wants to make it harder to prosecute torture. But that in flat terms is what the bill does. We often hear people saying, oh, you should read the bill more carefully. Um, us, we read it very, very, very carefully. We've talked to many leading lawyers who have talked about it, uh, who have looked at it very carefully. And finally, just to go to the point that Nadine was also highlighting there, we have an extraordinary situation where the government itself asked in its consultation last year, uh, within the consultation, question 11 of that said, should we perhaps exclude from this rape, sexual violence, and or torture. The government itself came back and said, actually, sexual violence should not be included. You shouldn't be able to get off from rape or sexual violence after five years. And we're very pleased for that. That is a truly horrific crime, which has so much impact on so many people's lives. But torture is something which is intended to break the individual, to destroy the individual, to destroy lives, and indeed it destroys, destroys society as a knock-on impact of that. The idea that somehow torture and indeed other grave crimes can be seen as a lesser crime seems to me and seems to us to be utterly unthinkable. So I very, very much hope that in these key weeks of discussion that lie ahead of us, it will be with full agreement that we can't just have one very small and limited area being excluded, that a much broader area of terrible, terrible crimes must be excluded. And as we've heard from Rob Gallimore, but also from many, many others, many people within the military themselves are deeply uncomfortable with this. And I think we need to remember this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Okay, we're gonna to go to questions. Um, we've got a lot coming in from the audience. But one thing I just want to put to Dominic, which is, you know, we've we've kind of there's a consensus here that vexatious claims do come forward and are a problem. Um, how do we resolve them if not through this? How do we stop them if not through this overseas operations bill? Uh, 
I don't think you need legislation. You've got to remember that the origin of all this comes from the Iraq and, and the Afghan allegations, some of which um, may have been correct, uh, but most of which were not. And I suspect we were very ill prepared to deal with that. We hadn't sorted out, just to take an example, the idea of an independent investigation, which would be separate from, say, the in investigation by the military police reporting up to the service prosecution authority. That's just one example of, of, of difficult areas for us. We actually did sort it out. But I'm afraid that by the time we did, the um, what I call the feeding frenzy, which is, as I say, a disreputable aspect of this had got underway. And it also had enough traction precisely because the UK government was seen as floundering in its initial responses for people to think that there was some terrible series of crimes to be investigated. And that then led to the allegations against individual members of the armed forces, which have only now just about been cleared up. I think Dame Heather Hallett's latest report is the final, I'd like to think, the, the end of this saga. But actually, if we have the right processes in place, and we keep, we don't allow feeding, media feeding frenzies to grow on this. I actually think that most of these allegations can be investigated and resolved pretty quickly. Of course, you can't prevent people making allegations. And one of the difficulties is in the interconnected world we're in, where somebody in Iraq will be on the internet and will able to, to follow through how you can make an allegation, they're quite easy to do. The question is, how quickly can you resolve them? And I actually think that's the solution. I think trying to change the law doesn't solve the problem. I mentioned one possible change to the law, which is the government is concerned about claims being brought by its own service personnel in the context of military operations, which has been an area of difficulty. Then let's go back to where we had with Crown immunity, although some service personnel might not be happy about that. These are claims, for example, about not being given the right equipment. But it's right to point out that at the moment, no such claim has succeeded in the context of an operation, military operation. But that's what, apart from that, I would actually say that what you need is to have the right investigative processes in place, which is the Attorney General, a Service Prosecution Director, worth bearing in mind that one of the last Service Prosecution Directors has joined in saying that this bill, along with uh, Lord Guthrie and, and uh, uh, General Parker to say that this is in fact a bad piece of legislation. Um, and that's what you should do. I don't really think legislation is needed. If somebody has got a case for making legislation, all I can say is that as an ex-AG, I'd be happy to listen. But nobody's made that case to me successfully at present. Great. Thank you, Dominic. And then, Bob, over to you. So this point um, about the exemptions within the bill around sexual violence, that seems to imply that other crimes such as torture that somehow there is a sort of way out for that if the government felt that there was a need to put the exemption in on sexual violence there's almost uh, an admission there that perhaps something around torture after five years might be permissible under the bill mute myself um well i don't think torture is Torture is permissible under any circumstances, and um, the bill, I don't. I don't think the bill mentions torture actually. Or, um, I think I looked at that. I did actually read it too, um, and I can't recall it does torture cover. being mentioned because I I feel and when I was in the House of Commons, I said, look, torture is quite clearly and specifically not allowed under the Geneva Conventions, and I actually consider the Geneva Conventions to be the most authoritative document um, in the world on, on this matter. Uh, and I, I've used them. I, I have used the Geneva Conventions and quoted them in the field when I was in Bosnia, certainly. Um, so I don't actually see, I don't mind whether torture, I'd like it to have been in Schedule 1, but I, I'm not going to go down a ditch on it um, because torture is prohibited, end of. Great. Let's let's open it up to questions from the floor. So Mia Rosselli has asked, it's my understanding that currently only officers are trained to understand the principles of international humanitarian law, law of law, law of war, sorry. Should that be expanded to all serving soldiers? There perhaps 
Rob, that might be something for you. I'm afraid it's a short answer. It's not true. Um, it, 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 it's trickled down to everybody. Um, I mean, you could. I, I'm, only, I'm trying to throw myself back to staff college where we, perhaps we did a little bit more on it. But no, that, that's that's simply not true. Um, soldiers, that this is trained down to the very lowest level. Okay. Uh, Andy Bevan has asked, does the panel agree that the law of war needs to change to reflect the era of long range killings, as with drones? Dominic, perhaps you have something to say on that. I'm not sure it needs to be. You see, there's no difference between a person sitting in a in a hangar somewhere at an RAF base uh, targeting with a drone and somebody who's on the ground with a rifle. The, the legal principles are exactly the same as to what is or is not permissible. Uh, and we, we looked at this, I mean, my committee I can't go into the details, but, but the Intelligence Security Committee looked at the issue of drone strikes. Uh, they're in, uh, remember, these are not in a complete operational context, but they had to be each one had to be reasonable, necessary and a proportionate response to a military threat in the context in which it took place. And actually, we were able to provide assurance that we were satisfied that the underlying intelligence justified the Syrian drone strikes, including against UK nationals. So I, I, I I actually think the existing legal framework applies whether you are in, in combat on the ground or whether you are, in fact, using standoff weapons. There is no distinction. OK, Fred Jones has asked if the rules of law, uh, sorry, if the rules of war need re-examining and how can the UK take other countries with it rather than introducing unilateral measures? Bob Stewart. Well, I'm not sure the, the laws of war do need revision. I think um, I agree with what Dominic's just said on drones. The, the laws of war apply. You can't you can't release a drone. And I've I've been to some of these headquarters, and they are very strict about you know you've got to make sure. For example, um, one of the one of the requirements before you release a drone strike is you've got to be pretty damn certain, in fact, almost absolutely certain these days that there are no civilians in the area or it's not near a hospital or it's near a school. Yeah, there are mistakes made, but that, those are part of, part of what actually happens. And I've been to the operational uh, centre in Riyadh, for example, where I asked this question and, and spoke to the operators there. And I've also been to RF Waddington, which is where, you know, British drones, drones are rather controlled from. I'm not sure that we need to change the, the laws of war. And as I say, from my point of view, um, I consider the laws of war start, and I have a very good start point in the Geneva Conventions. Dominic. I'm just going to say, I mean, there is an issue. I, I touched on it in my introduction about the overlap between the Geneva Conventions and the European Convention on Human Rights and the way it's been interpreted by the European Court of Human Rights, which did give the UK government areas of concern that there was an encroachment by human rights law into the simplicities of the Geneva Convention. Now, as it ha I, I, I happen to think this is correct. Um, but fortunately, the evidence suggests that the Court of Human Rights has understood it. Our own Supreme Court has clearly understood it and tried to make sure that the two are reconciled. Uh, if there is an area where we can work, and as long as we rem remain signatories of the Convention, I have absolutely no doubt that we can work with key partners like France in trying to make sure that there's an understanding that the European Convention on Human Rights should not be used or developed in a way which starts m m creating a, a, a conflict with the Geneva Conventions. And as I say, there was a risk, I accept it, of that developing, but I think, I hope, it's now largely gone away. Uh, the UK government had rather taken the view that the convention didn't apply abroad at all, and so had ignored it. And I'm afraid that the jurisprudence is that it does apply abroad in circumstances where you are exercising control. Different thing from being, say, in the middle of a battlefield against a foreign state. Uh, but I think that's something that we're going to have to live with. 
Uh, and my view is it is reconcilable with the Geneva Conventions and we're heading in the right direction. But certainly the UK could use its influence to ensure that that continues. Great. Fiona Watts has asked, should the UK revise its official secrets legislation, permit whistleblowers a greater role in exposing torture and abuse, especially given the experiences of the noughties? Steve, perhaps I could come to you on that. Yes, I mean, without, um, and, and apologies, without giving a, a direct answer to that question, I think that it is extraordinarily important as a matter of principle that those who indeed call out, who blow the whistle on what is happening, should uh, have and should be, and that, that should be acted on. But that also goes a little bit upstream again. It's the signal that's being sent within the armed forces. And that's the thing which comes down to everything, really. The signal being sent, as Rob also described earlier, at the moment, we see some very clear signals. And what is needed is the follow through that comes from that. And I just wanted very briefly to go back to what Bob Stewart was saying earlier about the bill itself. The bill doesn't mention torture, he said, which is covered by the Geneva Conventions. That's absolutely right. It doesn't, because it's as if you like, it's the, the dog that didn't bark um, from the, the Sherlock Holmes story, that the fact that it's not in there as mentioned as an exclusion, that's the problem. It's not just torture. It's torture and other grave crimes. But torture is the most obvious one, which is so extraordinary. Um, but there are many other grave crimes which are not included. And there's a group which is defined as grave crimes under international law. So that's the problem, is that there's a one small carve out. But going to those who, who, uh, who call it out and say, this is what's happening. Clearly, those are doing a service to the armed forces. They are not damaging. And we've seen occasions in the past where somehow they have seen as being the, the problem rather than the solution. Actually, these are absolutely the, the solution, I would argue. And the armed forces know very well that discipline matters so much. It was heartening to see that when Donald Trump um, last year was uh, trying to give pardons to some soldiers who were uh, accused of war crimes. And he thought, yeah, you've been brave people and therefore, well, they may perhaps have been brave, although difficult to know in terms of if they were actually committed with alleged war crimes. But crucially, senior people at the Pentagon stood up and said, this is not the thing that we want to see for the good of all of us, we need to have very clear signals. And that's our worry, is that this bill as it stands at the moment actually sends the opposite signal, is that in certain circumstances, you move on, turn a blind eye. The devastating impact that that could have really cannot be overstated. I'm going to go to another question now, and I think this one may be uh, something for you to answer, Bob. Uh, Paulina Robertson asks, Charges of war crimes likely to include torture were brought against uh, the president of Kosovo this year by a court in The Hague. The UK government has been fairly quiet on this development. Should the gov government speak out more firmly? Uh, you're talking about the International Criminal Court. Well, um, I've never had any dealings with the International Criminal Court, but I've given evidence in five trials in the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Republic of Yugoslavia. To be honest, the requirement to go to the International Criminal Court, and I'm sure Dominic will correct me if I'm wrong here, normally occurs when people believe that a country like Kosovo has not brought um, charges against a person who might have done something wrong in which case the International Criminal Court might pick it up. In this case, I'm going to run for the fields here because I don't know much, much about this one, but I just lay out the principle. Uh, the International Criminal Court, I think, will only pick up something that if a country doesn't actually bring a prosecution. I'm sure that's right, Dominic, isn't it? Yeah, yes, it is right. Uh, and uh, the ICC will only come in if it thinks that the, the country or place concerned is not taking the matter seriously, uh, which is one of the reasons why it's so important that the United Kingdom should never be in that position itself. I've got another question here from Isabella Hill. Uh, and actually, this is one for Nadine, really, uh, which is aside from the problems with this legislation, what other specific policies would you like to see the UK adopt to fight torture internationally? 
You need to unmute yeah. yourself. Yeah. I can hear that. Could you say that again, please? Uh, so uh, Isabella mm -hmm. Hill has asked, mm -hmm. aside from the problems with this legislation, what other specific policies would you like to see the UK adopt to fight torture internationally? I think that I would like to see policies that support organisations locally that are actually protecting survivors after they have suffered stigma, because we know that stigma is a big thing with survivors. And if we have policies where, because I'll talk specifically about the uh, initiative of um, uh, the UK government that is leading and has invited a lot of countries, every survivor feels ashamed of what has happened to them. So the blame is really shifted here. And I think that if we have policies that really support survivors to that line, that would be very a very good example set in influencing cultures and people's really mindset in the way that the survivors are treated, even though they are the victims. So it looks like the blame is really shifted. The perpetrator get away easily, but the survivor is left with the one putting a shame. More policy to really strengthen and giving community power to actually protect people who need the protection in that sense and to be rehabilitated and reintroducing their communities as well. I think. This, Leadership in that sense will also be like the, really the strong work done on the ground that is needed in setting an example. I don't know if I've answered that. Yeah, no, no, that's good. Thank you, Nadine. Um, so a question now from Neil Mukherjee, uh, who has asked, um, how can we improve our military code of practice? Do you think that war is beyond the code of practice? What is the status of military diplomatic immunity? Uh, so a few questions there. Rob, perhaps you want to come back. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, as a, you know, I'm almost a decade out of date. But but when I left uh, and when when I had it to guide me um, for, for 10 years, it, it was pretty spot on. Um, hmm. I, I sound like I think we're faultless uh, and I don't. And faults can happen in how it's applied and sometimes even the quality of the people who apply it. But actually the guidance... Uh, is, is, is spot on. It, do, it doesn't need alteration. I, I, say, I, I think that's my impression as well. Um, I, I'm not conscious that the, the, the code which is provided to the armed forces of the engagement, particularly when they're going into a, a, an operational theatre, seems to me to be in any way deficient. Uh, and it seems to me to work well and picking up the point that was made earlier to be percolated down to every level of the armed forces. Uh, and of course, there's no diplomatic immunity for the armed forces, except in so far as some armed forces personnel. I know there's the, the US example of, uh, of US personnel who may have some level of diplomatic immunity in this country. But that's a rather separate issue. It's not about operational conditions. OK, thank you for that. That's good clarification. Christopher Clark has asked, what is the UK government doing to ensure uh, to make all parties to the G Geneva Convention sign protocols one and two? Oh, Bob Stewart, perhaps you might want to come in on that. It's a question, I suppose, uh, about foreign policy, really. Uh, well, uh, I don't think we can force ourselves on any um, foreign government. I'm not quite sure what you mean by Protocols 1 or 2, but the uh, Geneva Conventions, we get there the high contracting parties, as the normal cry, which presumably means states. Um, I'm not sure we can force any state to do it. It's um, it's a moral thing, and it, I hope it's slightly connected to the United Nations as well. But I think that you each state decides whether it it applies the Geneva Conventions or not. Some apparently do not. Yes, I, I, I hesitate to say that my experience when I was in government is that success in persuading countries to sign up to international agreements or protocols to agreements that the United Kingdom is promoting is very dependent on the United Kingdom's general status. And if it's seen as being a country promoting rules-based international system, it punches above its weight. And if it does not, well, then I'm afraid it starts to punch under its weight or perhaps to its weight, which is of a country of 65 million people. Uh, and that's it. And I regret to have to say this, but at the moment, 
well, not just over this bill, the operations bill, but I'm afraid over the internal markets bill, there is a knock-on effect on the way in which other countries will perceive the United Kingdom if it's not seen to be taking international obligations seriously. Uh, it's one of those really intangible things, but it matters. And on the whole, we have prospered as a country uh, by having that status. And we are, I'm afraid at the moment, in danger of losing it. Great. We are coming towards the end. There's one question, uh, Bob, which I thought you might want to answer finally, which is from Lillian Dimesh, who asks, without a time limit, how do we deal with the long, so, long saga over Northern Ireland soldiers whose lives have been destroyed by the present unsatisfactory process? That's very difficult, to be honest. I mean, it's one that um, I'm on the Northern Ireland Committee it's one that is is a is a real problem. I mean, the the feeling among the veterans, and I'm quite well connected there, insofar as I'm part of the Northern Ireland veterans community uh, and the association, is that you know, for goodness' sake, they've been investigated, investigated, investigated. For example, you know, some some people have been investigated lots of times and. Some people are still being resummoned to Northern Ireland, what, 40 years afterwards. Now, I am not of the opinion that time dispenses the requirement for justice. I don't agree with that. I, don't, I think that uh, if you've done wrong, you've done wrong, and etc. But there is a real problem also, which I'm quite sure others on the panel will agree, particularly Dominic, of getting evidence. For example, Dennis Hitchens, who is, who's been accused and is going back to court again in February, and he's in his late 70s and he's got, you know, a really serious illness as well, um, has been accused of a shooting, of a shooting, a fatality shooting. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail, but the, the fact of the matter is the guy didn't actually shoot the guy. He, he, he shot high. Um, but he's still, the, the other two people that might have done are dead. It's, it's a really difficult one. Uh, to to get evidence too, and uh, some people say, well, they're so old now, it, it, it's rather irrelevant. But actually, you've then got to connect to the people who are the victims, the people that were killed, obviously, but also the families who've lost people. And I'm thinking Bloody Sunday, for example, uh, 1972, um, where 13 civilians were killed. Uh, I don't want to go too far into that either. They've had so many inquiries about this. But on the facts of it, 13 civilians killed, no paras wounded or, or, or killed themselves. Something's clearly gone wrong. Um, it is very, very difficult. And here in this, the overseas bill, the overseas service bill, you have the, um, the attorney general being part of the system. If you had that sort of system for Northern Ireland, you have the director of public prosecutions in Northern Ireland, who actually might not be the same sort of person. Um, I mean, he is probably Sinn Féin. Well, he is. He or she will be Sinn Féin. Uh, so there, there might be difficult. It's difficult. It is very difficult. And it's going to be, it, it's a thorn that we're going to have to pluck. And the government have promised to pluck it by Christmas. Um, and sort this out, but frankly, I can't see how. Great. Okay, we're coming to an end. So there's just a very final question that I'm going to ask every speaker, and if the answer from them could be one sentence and one sentence alone, which is on the overseas operations bill, do you want to see it dropped altogether, kept, or amended? And if amended, in in what way, as concisely as possible? So, Bob. I want to keep it. It's not perfect, but it's better than the system that applies now. Nadine? I think it's wrong to put a time limitation to when people can come and feel able to claim the right. So I think it does need an amendment in that sense in regards to torture. Okay. Steve? I think the bill itself is deeply flawed in many of the ways that we've heard. But if you ask me to narrow it down, I think it is extraordinary that we have one rule on one horrific crime, but torture and other grave crimes are not covered by that. That, that for me, is beyond extraordinary. There are many, many other issues, but if you reduce it down, that is beyond extraordinary. And I hope all can agree on that point. 
Dominic? I agree with Steve about it. I personally think, for the reasons I gave initially, the bill isn't remediable. It honestly ought to be dropped. It's not going to make, it's not going to deliver what people want from it. I mean, this is the thing which really gets me more than anything else. And once you take torture out, we must take murder out as well. I mean, are we really seriously saying that murder shouldn't be investigated? It, this, this is, there's something unrealistic about it. I'm afraid I think it is a flawed piece of legislation. And if I could think of a way of remedying it, I would come up with it. Rob? Yeah, leave the layman to last. Um, I mean, it, it seems, I'm not sure it seems necessary. It, it seems hastily put together, which probably means it should be dropped. Great. OK, well, thank you to all of our speakers for a, a very interesting uh, and thoughtful uh, discussion. And obviously, um, very important and very timely uh, as the Overseas Operations Bill is making way to Parliament at the moment. Uh, thank you to Freedom From Torture for partnering with us on the event. Um, for those of you who are interested in coming to some more bright blue events, we're in this designated tent throughout the whole of the digital conference. The next event will appear, uh, the details of which will appear um, on the screen after this event. Uh, just to say, if you're interested in Bright Blue, you can become a member. Uh, the details are here, look, captioned. Um, so please do check that out on our website. So finally, a virtual round of applause to our speakers. Thank you very much for your time and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.